awesome though. So man, appreciate you hopping on here. Thanks, yeah. You're used to this, right? This is second nature for you these days. Yes, so, sir. Man. I just want to get started with you on like what you're doing now. Yeah. After the NFL, after being a professional athlete. Yeah, bro. And again, you're you're not shy of the camera these days. So yeah, man. what are you up to these days? Man, first, man, I, I want to say thanks for having me on, Tyler, bro. Appreciate it, man. We've, uh, me and Tyler connected, you know, over, like, you know, during the pandemic, I think. Yeah. And uh, just kind of had lunches and love the way things, love what you're doing on social media. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm truly appreciative, bro. And I don't know, man. I'm just trying to stack stuff, you know, and, and build. And um, I call it the dream of the second attention, yeah. you know, and. And for me, um, the dream of the first attention, and this is Don Miguel Ruiz, fifth agreements, four agreements. Uh, mm. my, my, my first dream was, you know, I was a kid in, the, in, in my mom's house that dreamed of being a football player, and dreamed of uh, going to NFL and, and making money and, uh, and riding off into the sunset. But the, what's so cool about the dream of the second attention is uh, you take every lesson that you learned from the dream of the first attention and it gives you all the tools you need for the second dream, right? And your second dream is your purpose. And so I'm loving living in my purpose, being a father, being a husband, um, just being a cool dude, you know, making business connections, you know, BD, being an entrepreneur, um, media stuff. I like to mix, you know, I like to be a renaissance man, if you will. Yeah. And I like to use all the hours in a day if I can. Um, and then also, you know, got hobbies, still hoop a little bit, still stay in oh, shape. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Me and my boys, we got a rec league down here in okay. downtown Columbus. And you guys need a water boy? <laughs> Yo, we always, you know, we always have guys missing because of business okay. and stuff like that. Our family, so hey, it's a spot on the roster for. All you. right, all right. <laughs> I'm I'm from the cornfields, but I can, <laughs> hey, just play D, hey, bro. There we go. You, you need that the guy that's like you yeah. know throwing the elbows. And we need five fouls every now and then. <laughs> hey, that's yeah. right. I'm good for five fouls. I can talk smack. So yeah, you yeah. let me know when you need me. Yeah, man. Yeah, dude, you were just in Hawaii with the family. Uh, yeah. What's it like to? You know, a lot of people know you from mm -hmm. playing at Ohio State, mm -hmm. having an NFL yeah. and a professional career in the CFL as well. And, yeah, you know, man. now you're doing media. Yeah. Um, what's it like to juggle a family? Yeah. What's it like to juggle that lifestyle? And being, uh, a, being a dad and a husband, it's the best role I get to play. Being around my sons every day, teaching them lessons. I always joke my oldest son, like he raised me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like he, he helped me become a uh, better version of myself you know me and my wife we she's my best friend my business partner she's your boss you're just taking photos that, you know what I'm, I mean? I'm actually here right you know now what I mean? so that's that's the you know I, i'm the ceo she's the chairman for sure so just just being able to uh take some time to unplug with them and just be able to uh just be able to enjoy you know, family and a different place and mm -hmm. give the give the boys experiences and and things like that. It's it's amazing, man. I mean, 2022 was a it was a it was a real it was a real last year for me. You know, what I mean, I just I retired from football in 20, November 2021, um, you know, just trying to set the goals and lay the foundation for the dream of the second attention all last year. And and then um Spending time full full time at home, you know, no training camps, no being away, yeah. you know, living out of a bag in a, in a studio up in Canada or, you know, in another city. So it was just uh, it was a transitional year. So just being able to unplug with them was it was dope, man. We enjoyed it, man. We did some Absolutely. cool stuff out there. What inspired you to start playing football? Oh man, I when I first saw the game, man, I, I was about what. Kindergarten, you know, mm -hmm. my, my cousin, I'm sorry, the year before kindergarten, I had a cousin that played on the local mm -hmm. park team on the Hilltop Hawks. It's an organization I'm still connected with today. We still do cool stuff with them with the nonprofit. And um, just seeing, you know, you know, the cheerleaders, the, the smell of the grass, the hot dogs, the popcorn, you know, the concession stand, just and um just that whole environment. I just wanted to be a part of it. Like I just, I felt like it was always for me. Yeah. So I played football, man. 
it's the thing I've done football longer than I've done anything in my life. Like I started playing the year before kindergarten, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Every year I played football, you know, longer than I was ever in school. And um, it wasn't just, like a parent that said, hey, go nah, try soccer, basketball. Nah, it just came football. naturally, bro. Yeah. Like, I mean, um, I had an uncle that played at Michigan. Um, I had cousins like, you know, Andrew Hawkins, Artrell Hawkins. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, some might say it's a DNA thing, sort of came here that way. And and me and my bro, we would just, you know, I had a brother that's two years older than me. He played mm -hmm. at Ohio University, played in the league, played in the CFL too, and Julian Posey. And, we just loved it, man. We just loved yeah. being outside, tackling, playing in the snow, you know, after school. You know, it was a funny story. You know, there was this flag football, like, you know, when flag football was big. Yeah. We stole the flag football set from our elementary school. So, like, we had this plan, like, you know, I was like the, you know how you would pick up toys at recess? Yeah, yeah. So, I left the flag football set outside on accident. Yeah, strategically. And after, yeah, on <laughs> after, and after school, me and my brother went back through the parking yeah. lot, picked up the bag, took the long way home. And then every Friday we would like plan like a flag football That's awesome. game at, at the park and yeah. the local neighborhood kids yeah. would come. And I just, I just always loved it, man. Yeah. I love the, you know, the pain, the, you know, the brutalness to it, the, the strategic chess match side. And just, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful game, man. It's a beautiful game. What, what have you learned about, playing the game of football and how yeah. that translates into like life and yeah. the transition you had to make in 2022. Mm -hmm. A lot of players can't make that transition. A lot yeah. of them go broke. A lot of yeah. them have, um, you know, a specific mentality that they might lose because their whole mm -hmm. identity is attached to that. Like yeah. you said, it's you've done nothing else more in your life other than playing football. Yeah. So I'd like to kind of hear more about that. Um, I guess with football, man, it's, uh, I, growing up, you would always hear coaches say, you know, football, it'll teach you about life, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the things that you don't realize, there's things that happen in a season. There's things that happen in your career that are microcosmos of life, are examples mm -hmm. of adversity, examples of perseverance, examples of you know, overcoming and, and, you know, and winning a championship is almost like, you know, getting a big business deal done, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, it's just, it teaches you, uh, it gives you character. Mm -hmm. and so, so if you will, and so discipline, and discipline, you know, and, and my sons have sports and I mean, I, and just being a parent, I always feel like, Hey, like I want my kid to have a military or sports, some type of background, just yeah. like, come from some type of discipline sure because it teaches you how to attack life every day it teaches you how yeah. to like set up structure a schedule um how to I handle think, adversity yeah yeah absolutely and i think also too i'm not i'm not a parent i just have my little mm -hmm. psychotic dog poppy mm -hmm. Shout out to oh poppy. no you're a parent bro <laughs> <laughs> but i think one thing i think about often too is like why would i have my kid i think it could potentially make parenting a little bit more enjoyable where you're trying to maybe tell your son yeah. these disciplined things. Whereas I learned a lot of that from coaches growing up as well. Yeah. Right. Or a lot of people yeah. learn that from, you know, if your parents tell you to do something or they give mm -hmm. you advice, you're like, nah, but then when someone else, like your coach, your teacher, mm -hmm. your mentor, your friend tells you, you're like, ah, oh. and the yeah. parents like, yo, I've been <laughs> telling you that for years. Yeah. <laughs> so I think also it, it potentially helps parents yeah. be parents and have fun but then yeah. their coach can also yeah. help instill discipline into them as well you can yeah. be saying the same thing to your yeah. son as the coach is but he's yeah. actually going to listen to the coach <laughs> man i'll be honest like just to touch on this like and this is like a touchy subject like when i'm working with kids or stuff like i don't charge like mm -hmm. why would i charge a parent to give them an experience you know what i mean like there's a lot of guys who are former players who are trainers and you know, I'm not trying to disrespect anybody, but the park teams and the coaches, mm -hmm. those were dudes who were doing it out of the kindness of their heart. Yeah. You know, those were dudes in our in my life who wanted to really that saw something in kids who who might not have had that father figure. Absolutely. And um really were just giving their time. Mm -hmm. And and I just truly believe like when I'm doing stuff in the community with my foundation mm -hmm. or if I'm 
spending time coaching my son's team or see another kid like I do that stuff because these kids need positive role models like they need That's someone right. who's been through it you know not trying to hit their parents pockets you yeah. know like in this game this training world this uh, you know this AAU culture seven on seven culture has turned into a money grab yeah. where our kids need positive role models. Our kids need people who can instill lessons and tell them like, yo, like when you got cut from that team or the reason you're not starting, mm -hmm. you got an opportunity to overcome this. And so once that kid gets that lesson in life, when he doesn't get into the, or he doesn't get that scholarship or that, that developer or that bank says no on the loan, you have an experience with overcoming failure. And yeah. so like, you can take that experience from this sport, translate it to business, translate it to school, translate it to family, and now you have something in your in your treasure chest that you're like, yo, like, I know how to overcome this. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And even coming back to like, you know, family members that had played at a high level, mm -hmm. you know, you said it's in your DNA. I think that stuff actually does legitimately go through your DNA. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah. okay, well, everyone i'm associated with the power of like your environment your mm -hmm. cousins your uncle yeah. whoever it is it's they had to go through adversity as well and that just is like a mentality that gets instilled that yeah. adversity is going to happen no matter what yeah. but putting yourself i think in like self-adversity mm -hmm. situations to be yeah. disciplined when life adversity hits yeah. you're a little bit more prepared but i like what you said about yeah. um like mentorship and whatnot what was it like one, who was your biggest mentor? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump to a conclusion and say Trestle being mm -hmm. one of them. I yeah. could be completely wrong, mm -hmm. but maybe uh, just shed some light on like who is the biggest mentor mm -hmm. and uh, maybe the best coach and what it was like to. Yeah, I'll be honest, man. My, I love Jimmy T, man. That's that's my man forever. Mm -hmm. We got crazy experiences together. One game's been in the lows of the lows. Like we, when we talk, you know, we. You know, it's, it's not a normal coach and, and player yeah. talk, but but my uncle, man, Clint Hastlerig, he uh, played at St. Xavier High School, Cincinnati. Legend. Um, Legendary. Know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Played at the University of Michigan, got drafted, San Francisco 49ers, bought a crib just south of Napa when he got drafted mm -hmm. in like the oh, 70s. Um, played there. He was like a, like a 70s. 60s 70s you know nfl journeyman if yeah, you will yeah. special teams fullback he was oj yeah. oj simpson's fullback in buffalo oh, no okay um my grandma always would tell this funny story when oj came to our house for thanksgiving you know they were playing the Bengals on thanksgiving one year Did he cut the turkey no well he came in and was like oh miss hastlerick my, my uncle's name is clint hastlerick my grandma that's my grandma's maiden name he's like oh like you didn't have to do all this for me and she like <laughs> Your head really is big as hell. Yeah. <laughs> this for my son, you know what I mean. So my whole family knows that story, oh, wow. and um, and so my uncle, man, he always told me like, yo, like, if you want to make it, boom, 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 that's what you got to do. Mm. You know, if you if you want to be, you know, a four or five star in Ohio, boom, 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 that's what you got to do. What, what were those things that you had to do? Well, like he always just looked at it like, uh, it, I mean, a Tyler. The thing about me, I'm like, I'm a ten thousand rock guy. I mean, mm. I, at this time when I was a kid, I didn't know. But if there's ten if there's ten thousand dollars under one of those ten thousand rocks, I'm gonna turn over nine hundred nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine of them. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do whatever it takes. Yep. Um I like I don't care about pain. I don't really care about adversity. Like mm -hmm. it's all about the goal. You know what I mean? Like and then guys I play with, guys I played against, they'll tell you like, I nah, nah, depot, like like he for real. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I'm gonna try and win every sprint. I'm gonna try and compete with you in the weight room. Mm -hmm. Like you gonna have to kill me to beat me type yeah. of type of thing. Like, you know, I mean, that's just this is who I am. Like yeah. even in rec ball, like <laughs> I get in arguments all the time. Like yeah. I just that's just how I am. And so my uncle always knew that. And so he told me, he said, yo, like, uh, I didn't play varsity football until junior year. Yeah, right, wow. right. So I was just a J Were I was a hooper. Saint Xavier? Saint, Saint LaSalle. LaSalle. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We played San X and Elder and Molar and all that was okay. our league. But so you were not like a Church League school. You no, know, no, it was GCL. Yeah, it's just no. Division One. You yeah. know, um, at the time, you know, big, big football in Ohio. So, say, yo, like, 
if you want to be considered fast, you got to make it to the state championship for track. Mm -hmm. Okay. Check mark. Won the state. We're in the 400 meter dash senior year. Mm -hmm. Boom. You want to be a national recruit. You got to go to one of those Nike scout.com camps and, and ball out on one on ones. Check mark. Boom. Win yeah. kill those dudes. This is what your uncle's telling you, right? This, he's telling me everything. Hey, yo, like if you want to be, you know, a Mac player or a Big Ten player, got to have a big year. Boom. You got to return kicks. You got to check mark, check mark. Boom. Yeah. You know, you want to play as a freshman, first thing you got to do is you got to make the travel squad at college. Boom, check mark. Okay, Unc, I got you. You know, um, this is your mindset going into training camp. You know, look at it as like a retreat every year. You know, things like that. Like just, I mean, and it, it really is. You know, you go into, people going to training camp and dread it. Like, I always looked at it as like, I don't got to answer my phone. That's what I'm saying, yeah. And like, like it's like yeah. a football retreat, you know, like. And, it's even, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, like yeah. even like traveling or. yeah. I call them like mini sprints of the marathon, right? Yeah, it's man. like, mm -hmm. I don't got to do laundry. I don't yeah, got to say like, 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 I don't got to coordinate the housekeeper to come clean and do this and do that. It's a super it's vacation for life, man. And honestly, I miss, train, like my wife's going to kill me, but I miss those little yeah. four to six weeks alone just to alone. lock in on a, yes. on a goal, man. It's like, you There's can't so get much, that. Yeah, it's hard now. We're all yeah. swiping. We're all doing this. Yeah. We're all doing that. And it's hard I think one of the best things people can do is I refer to it as like night vision focus, right? Yeah, like yeah. zero dark 30. Yeah. Just yeah. going, going yeah. inward. And yeah. when you get done with training camp, you go back to the hotel. Yeah. That's where the expansion is happening mm -hmm. where that mentality is built mm -hmm. where you're stretching a little bit more, you're just yeah. in your own space. So yeah, integrating man. that in your day-to-day -day life when it's just boom, cut off yep. are very difficult, but that's cool that your uncle was saying, yeah, Hey, look, yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah, two weeks or three weeks or a yeah. week, however long it is, like it's the best thing, best advice he ever gave me about training camp. Yeah, go to Target, go to Walmart, mm -hmm. buy a fresh pair of underwear for every day. <laughs> put on a fresh pair of drawers, fresh pair of white tee, refresh yourself, a good mm -hmm. feeling. You know, you know, fresh socks. You know, yeah. and just and just get to the grind every day. You know, like, like cracking that. that white tee, put it on, and just get to work. And so, like. There, there's times and seasons of life where I'm pretty sure you you go into those training camp mentalities where you're like, yo, like, doom, doom, doom. Yeah, Phones on, do not disturb. Yep. Six to eight weeks, let's let's lock in. Absolutely. Yeah, man. And that's and that's the whole thing where like football translates to life, life lesson, him being my mentor and just and everything he's ever said, you know, has came true, man. He, man he, and um and I really appreciate our relationship. And uh yeah, man. and then also, you know, you've had coaches and some of my best coaches I've been around. You know, it's crazy. Um, I've been blessed to be around um, great players. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like n nothing against my coaches, Coach Hazel, Coach Trez, those guys. But bro, I was pulling up the roster. Yeah, man. before you popped in, I was like, yeah. I forgot about all the like Sandsenbacher, right? You play with him, man, like crazy, yes. like player mentorship, like Dane. Yeah. Dane as a dude was like a worker. I mean, like he came from Toledo as like a two or three star and just like literally it's worked. Like I would leave the Woody and like drive by and be like, yo, is that Dane's Jeep out there? Like, you know, go back and dudes in there getting work on the field, working yeah. on those one-on-ones and like just a super, you know, super magician, super mechanical and just like, just, always two steps ahead man i was blessed to be in a room with heartline you know brian mm -hmm. heartline um he just got the yeah, offensive coordinator, office coordinator job yeah. like he was you know him and brian rabisky a lot of what people don't know about brian rabisky um his rabisky his pops was an nfl coach for 30 30 years i mean like his pops interviewed me at the combine so coach's son Heartline offensive coordinator now, Dane, you know, just being in a room with those guys as a freshman, I just was picking their brain, you know, following them, you know, what they're doing. Um, you know, when I got to the league, Andre Johnson, you know, Brandon Marshall, Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, Eric Decker, you know, uh, Michael Crabtree, Lamar Jackson, like up in Canada, uh, the greatest – uh canadian quarterback ricky ray a lot of people don't know about him man i mean he's the only canadian quarterback that's won four great cups sj green has had over ten thousand receiving yards in his career man i mean this dude is lebron's age 
and was still having 1200 yard seasons at age 33. I mean, and, and so I've been blessed to be around super vets, super cerebral guys who just Who's the most talented you've ever played with. Um, I'll be honest, hands down, like waking up out of the bed. Me. <laughs> I got to give it to TP, man. Like Terrell Pryor, like, you know, like what people don't know about the dude, he was 6'6", six, six, ran a 4'3", he played eight years at receiver. And at the time he was the best quarterback in the Big Ten, you know, like. The country, maybe. It, it, maybe. I mean, he was yeah. a Heisman candidate, yeah. you know, going into the year that. Um, Cam Newton won, you know, and just out of the bed, God given, and probably got to give it to that dude, you know, like just super blessed, man. Um, and and, one uh, season transition. To- yeah, man. Receiver. Yeah. I mean, but no, like and the thing with TP that people don't realize is like, he's kind of pre Russell Wilson. And, and I just believe like Russell Wilson, like changed the game for black quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like before Russell Wilson, the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl was Doug Williams with the Washington Redskins. And I was like a what, like a 40 year gap. I don't even know. Like yeah. I checked the stats, but like yeah, it's like, and yeah. so like Russ won as a black quarterback, opened the door for Lamar, Patty, Deshaun Watson. You know, they're not asking these guys to move the receiver anymore. And, and just to touch on T, I think he like, he like just barely missed that, that window um, I think he had made that transition to receiver like the same second year Russ won. And so, but uh, yeah, man, it's just, it's crazy, man. But hands down, one of the most talented yeah. dudes for sure. I give it to my dog. Wasn't like one game in Cleveland. Uh, and I don't know. I'm a couch coach. I'm a diehard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a diehard. Pack. I am too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah I'm be coaching the Bengals up today. Yeah. You Bengals fan? I mess with Joey B. Hard body. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah he, Joey Hard. Yo, he's, yeah. He's hard. Dog mentality. Yeah, yeah. Dog he's from mentality. he's from the old man. He's yeah. in Athens, and my brother played for his pops at Ohio University. Oh yeah, Coach oh, Burroughs. Right. Yeah, my brother was a team captain for for his pops, and just my brother would tell me stories about when Joe was young and stuff like that. Is just gonna be good. Well, I mean, I mean, he's I mean, he got a degree from Ohio State. You know, yeah. I mean, he was literally in a battle with Dwayne Haskins. He like barely like Herb was oh, yeah. like. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who I'm picking. And, you know, he went with Dwayne, obviously, and then Joe went to LSU and had the year he had, and obviously he's just like carried on. But I, I like I think he's good for the Bengals. Yeah. Know? Like he he's good for the like I'm from Cincy. We need a guy like that. Absolutely. He called the fans out, bro. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah just Ohio boy, like yeah. just here to play football. Mm-hmm. He's got that little swagger to him. Mm-hmm. Oh, he got a lot of yeah. It's from Jamar Chase, so, right? So, yeah. nah, man, he got he he yeah. he a true Ohio player, bro. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's that's cool, man. That's cool to see that. Uh, out of all the people that you've been around, the athletes and coaches, and just overall talent, that it comes back down to your uncle, and I'm sure you understand that. Yeah. Even being a dad and leading your household with with your kids as well is understanding and recognizing like little small things that you can plug along the way. And like, I think that's something that's mm-hmm. going to be interesting to unfold the next generation is mm-hmm. maybe specific injuries yeah. because all they did was swing a baseball bat mm-hmm. right? and it ha- messes up their hip or their back or yeah. maybe in basketball, their ankles. They actually yeah. could have been a really good football player. It's crazy you say that because that's one thing I think the state of Ohio, OSHA, you know, Ohio mm-hmm. high school association, what they do well, um, you know, like Florida, Texas, and Cali, you can play all, I mean, they have spring football in high school. And I mean, you probably heard recruiters say, oh, like, I'll take a kid from, you know, Texas, Cali, or Florida, because they have that extra, like, I mean, if you're doing spring football for years, so it yeah. translates to a whole extra year of football. But what OSHA does is they have cutoffs, like yeah. strict cutoffs. It's like you, they want, three sport athletes. They Absolutely. want people to play multiple, you know, sports and, and with the rules. And so just the way Ohio is just rule based, it's like it kind of creates that for you. You know, you don't really have a choice. If I had to guess, I think having the ability to play multiple sports helps more than not. I mean, you even said Russell Wilson. Mm-hmm. He 
got drafted the MLB. Yeah. How does he throw the ball so well? Yeah. It's probably from throwing a baseball as well and working on that mechanic in a different mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. but also just like getting burnt out. I come yeah. from cornfield, Ohio and yeah, I mean, a lot of like uh, wrestlers, top tier wrestlers. And yeah. a lot of them now they just get burnt out. You're a kid yeah. and you're operating like you're Where's a your hometown again? Uh, Mechanicsburg. Shout out Mechanicsburg. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> you sound a, uh, you sound a little hillbilly when you say it. It's like natural. It rolls up. Mechanicsburg. <laughs> Shout out to the 937. Um, but that's one thing I noticed as well. And yeah. believe it or not, I grew up and my family was all oriented around like basketball, basketball, basketball. Mm-hmm. And then I realized I'm four foot tall. Right. And so <laughs> yeah. it was either a triple double of turnovers yeah. or I got lucky and got some points. But I started running. Right. Started running, building that mentality. I want to be the one that controls the destiny, but I never would have found out about running unless I was talking smack to my coach, which made me just run laps all day. Yeah. Right. But I yeah. think that's a huge potential problem. Are these kids thinking they have to play football all year round or basketball all year round? Yeah. And there's so many layers to it, uh, which I find to be interesting. But on the topic of health, I want you to just maybe share some of your health experiences, what's going on now in the NFL with concussions, you know, guys like Tua going down and what are maybe some tips and things you would have potentially done differently in college and in the professional. Um, that's a good one, man. Um, I'm a big health nut. So, some of my former teammates call me Dr. Poe yeah. <laughs> just cause I uh, always, uh, well, my rookie year, I tore my Achilles in a um, playoff game playing against New England Patriots. Um, divisional round. Sad, sad, sad. But, you know, failing on, and I call it like a failure just because I could have been better hydrated. You know, I could have mm-hmm. been doing acupuncture. I could have been doing the therapy. I was Does it just, bother you going into the game? Uh, I, think I, was, I think I was dealing with some plantar fasciitis that year. And um, I think it kind of just translated to maybe, you know, like a tight ankle, you know, my Achilles getting some tendonitis. But um, I was just always one of those dudes who were like, you know, like, I'm just going to out-talent you, you know what I mean? Like, And and so when I tore my Achilles, it it changed my work ethic. It changed my whole mentality towards health. I I got a blood test um, that off-season. I got a genetics test that literally showed me all of my allergies to food. Like the mineral kind of test, like a hair sample? No, no, like a like a real like true blood test that yeah, took files. Okay. And I got a panel that told me um what foods I, I can take that that help my body, you know, heal, get the inflammation, inflammation out. Yeah. So I, I had a strict yeah. nutraceutical, um, you know, strict diet. Um I also took like a pharmacogenomics test so I can understand what medicines I can and cannot take based mm-hmm. off my DNA. Um, I did a intestines cleanse, uh, small intestines, big intestines. Um, like I got my gut clean because mm-hmm. your gut, your gut controls your mood. People don't know that it's like you put food in your body. There's acid in your stomach. It dissolves it, and the fumes send the messages back. Right, like like it's. You know, can you imagine like boiling and, and like it sends the messages? So I reset. Well, your brain and gut is connected. Connected. Yeah. Yeah. In your mama's belly and then it disconnects and you have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I call it the, 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 the mind and the stomach type of thing. Like, you know, and like I try to make decisions from my gut morning yeah. here. It's crazy. We'll talk about that. But, but so like I understood, you know, cleaning my, my gut. Where did you Sending learn them. this from? Man, I, I was blessed to uh, like run across a lot of doctors um, that really, truly um, like helped change my mentality. Um, it was a doctor that I, you know, obviously good vets, you mm-hmm. know, pointed me in direction. Um, this doctor out of Atlanta just sort of re, re it's called Vitality Health. He just like reset my whole, um, my whole system, my whole stomach, my, my whole gut intestines, my whole gut intelligence, there we you go, know what yeah. I mean? And, and so I restarted my system after I tore my Achilles. It's normally like a nine to 12 month recovery. Five to six months, I was ready for training camp um, because I increased the like healing process by everything I put in my body was for my body. Yep. Um, so doing the blood work, 
going through all the protocol, a cleanse, mm-hmm. understanding the gut, understanding what creates inflammation, not inflammation. Uh, it can collapse that time significantly. Yeah, yeah, like bro. So that that helped, and then just what I can control, right? The prehab, rehab, um, acupuncture, Pilates, yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I just like became a pro's pro through my injury, and um, it's unfortunate because I kind of got the stigma like, oh wow, like this guy's injury prone. But like right when I was able to like master like my body, like with my all the things you mentioned, you know, nutrition, supplementation, vitamin, recovery, mm-hmm. half your body weight in water ounces a day. You know, like people think they're hydrated. Like, no, if you weigh 205, you need 102.5 ounces of water in your system to be ultimately hydrated understanding what hydration play understanding like you know but then also like yeah people think that salt is bad but understand the minerals in water mm-hmm. that hydrates you as well yeah, and, yeah, yeah um so yeah back to things that you were yeah like learning and doing yeah so and even even like in my supplementation drops under the tongue you know tinctures things like that like i wasn't a cbd guy at the time it was like like nah like real like magnesium mm-hmm. pro you know like calcium all that stuff just like more than you need and then just understanding like when you go out on that field you need something to burn right like and and, and just giving my body the right fuel to burn and like right when i mastered all that i got traded boom Yep. Got traded to the Jets on uh, draft night uh, on a Friday. I was actually in my house smoking hookah. Yeah. Boom, my phone rings. Was that not a part of the health protocol? <laughs> oh, no, that is. <laughs> there you go. It helps so, the mental. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it helps the mental side. You got that. You got to also, you know, get the mind right. So just chilling, get traded to the Jets. Boom, I just bought a crib in Houston. Oh. And um, it was just one, I had just had my son. Um, it was one of those things where it's like, yo, like, boom. And then I get there and this is where, like, I mastered my, my physical, you know, I understood how to take care of my body, but like my mind, yeah. I, I still was learning how to like master my mind and what stress, oxidative stress does, what, um, what not having a clear mind does or what like the power of the tongue. So when I got to the Jets, I always look at 2015 and 16 as years where I was learning. I was learning how to handle that mental side of things. I was getting married that year. So ultimately, you know, I got to the Jets, stressful situation, oxidative stress. I can't get over a pull hammy, you know what I mean? So when people give JSN, Jackson Smith and Jigba, you know, a hard time for pulling his hammy, I had a hammy that ultimately got me cut. I just couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't, I couldn't get over a pulled hammy. So when, that's the problem is yeah. like, you want to bounce back. Cause you have to, this is yeah. for my life, my career to feed my family, to make money. Yeah. And also like, you got to sometimes play through being hurt a little bit, but there's a difference, hurt and injury. Well, wait, for a receiver, it's almost like if a quarterback has a shoulder injury, everybody understands. Yeah. Like, yo, you threw a shitty ball cause his shoulders yeah. fucked up. If you got a hammy as a receiver, you're not getting open, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you ain't getting off the line. You don't got, ah, ah, you don't got all of that. You got that. Ah, ah. You yeah, got that. Right. yeah, one more time. <laughs> yeah, you lose that Bruce Lee. I got you know two good hammies. I still can't do that. So. You know what I'm saying? Like, you lose your wiggle. You lose the ability to open up. It's, you know, receivers, it's a brake system. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got Ferrari brakes. Like, Jamar yeah. Chase and Justin. Like, stop and go. Move. Those yeah. boys can stop on a dime and get back to full speed, that takes good hamstrings. You know what I'm saying? So I, uh, you know, I, I battled with that that year. Ultimately got cut. I was out the league, bro. I was at, I was just training. Um, I worked out for seven teams, man. Just, you know, just between, like I, I rented my crib out so I couldn't go back to Houston. So I was, I was trying my real estate stuff. I was there on that. Yeah, I was, my, I was a realtor. I was a landlord for a bit. Uh, from out of town, it was tough. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, I had to get a, a manager and stuff. So rented my crib out. So I came back to Ohio. Um, and I just was, uh, you know, I got called by the Bengals, you know, the Jets. I'm sorry, not the Jets. The Bengals, Broncos, Chicago, uh, Tennessee. Um, I'm trying to think. Also, I worked out for uh, 
think I did a Kansas City workout. And then, um, and so, in uh, Jacksonville, and, I, and this is like September, one workout. October, one workout. November, three workouts. December, three workouts. And so, when guys are like free agents and people are saying, like, oh man, keep grinding, get back in league. I think that's the hardest time in your career because you're like a pro, you got bread, but like, you're watching every dollar, but you got to stay in shape. You're on the fringe. And, and you're not in a rhythm either, I would imagine. You're, you're not, you know, football is a game. Yeah. If you're not getting, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Yeah. And the only way to get better is to play. Yeah. And so I kind of made up to my, and myself, I said, yo, like if a team signs me, I'm going to go and rock. But if I get cut again, I'm going to just go to Canada. I want to play because of all of the, you know, iceberg work that I did that was under surface, you know, understanding my body, understanding all these things. And, and I learned how to work again. I had like I felt like my core was you know, impeccable at the time with Pilates. And so I made a decision. Me and my wife had a long talk like, Yo, if I get cut again, I'm going to go to CFL. Mm -hmm. Are you cool with that? Like, are you cool with me going to another country and rocking? My brother was already up there playing. And so that year of 15, when I was out, we drove to Toronto. And, and I saw one of his games and I just was like, oh, whoa, like this is a real league. Like, yeah. you know, this is a different game. They have fan bases. Toronto is a fire city. Yeah, that's what I've heard. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like, yo, if, if I get an opt to go to Canada, I'm going to go. So Absolutely. I get signed in Denver um, in December. The Broncos? Yeah, Gary Kubiak, who drafted me to Houston, was the offensive coordinator in Denver. You know, and that's how things work. You, you kind of got to know a guy to know a guy. Were you messaged him? He messaged well, my him. agent kind of pulled the A, hey, you know, you want to give Devere a chance, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, let's take a look at him. So I went out there, had a great workout in December. I kinda, Me and my wife kind of made a choice. I was like, yo, I want to get back to my trainer that I did my combine stuff with. His name is Tony Villani, XPE. He created this uh, shred mill um, that's like you move it on your force. So he just believes in. Um, stride length times stride frequency equals speed. He believes in like true footwork, like efficient footwork. Guys like Mark Ingram, Travis Kelsey, Anquan Bolden, Eric Berry, Kareem Jackson, um, you know, Keanu Neal. All those guys have trained with Tony for years. And like, and when you go, Jamal Lewis, when you go to Tony, you always go back to the dojo because he gets to the true fundamental. He understands speed and efficient footwork. So, I made a choice to move my family to Miami to so I can train with Tony nice. and sort of like make one pack last push to get back into the league. And so I got I was in Denver, signed on a futures deal in December. Um then these boys ran the table and won the with Peyton. They went and yeah, won yeah. Super Bowl, Super Bowl fifty, beat Cam Newton, MVP Cam. But I was already signed to the team. Um, cause I signed in December and playoffs, obviously in January, just in February. So it was like awkward. Cause it was like, damn, I just won a Super Bowl. No, I didn't. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like I was signed for the 16 roster, not the 15 roster, uh -huh. but it was like, should I root for these guys? Because, uh, yeah. you know, when you're a free agent and this is like the fucked up part about being a free agent. So wait, you can sign for a year. You can sign a future. It's called, it's called, it's called a futures contract. So I signed a futures deal, which was for the next year, but I signed that December. And like, and a lot of free agents have feel me on this. It's like, you watch Sundays, like, hey, yo, you call your agent. Yo, I think that guy just twists his ankle, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, you know, so it's like, I couldn't like, I hated, I hated that feeling. You feel like yeah. a hater, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm, You're I'm not a hater. Your linebacker friend, like, yo. Take him out when he runs across. Well, the no, field. it's well, it's not that. It's just you want your opportunity. For sure, you know what I mean. And, but the law of attraction, the prayer line in the NFL, and the NBA, and the MLB, get in line, bro. Yeah. Everybody comes from the same situation. Everybody, you know, has your kind of background, and everybody has their opportunity. It's a matter of what you do with it. So. You don't want to ever hate on somebody's opportunity to get a second chance. And so guys that I got cool with, you know, Demaris Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, Benny Fowler, Cody Latimer, um, those guys, uh, you know, Jordan um, Norwood, Penn State dude, like awesome dudes. But like, yeah, I wanted my opportunity for my family, 
But in the same breath, like those guys came off a Super Bowl win. You know, yeah. I mean, those guys had camaraderie. Getting to Denver was more about integrating myself with this team that just want to chip. Yeah. You know what I mean? And understanding like kind of got to be one of the boys and also like compete with these guys too yeah, and just sort of respect what they built because I mean they were at the top of their game I mean and that was no fly zone came to leave TJ Ward Darian Stewart Bradley Roby Chris Harris I mean so tight-knit group yep. so just being there I just kind of like was like yo like if this doesn't work out I just want a ball bro so I end up getting cut early September I go back to Florida I start training with Tony again um and then uh I kind of made this just like yo I'm gonna go to Canada uh, when you go to Canada, they make you sign two-year deals. They make American players sign two-year deals, two-year rookie deals. But it's a one-on-one -one option. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of guys don't know is the team has the option, not you. Uh -huh. So I negotiated with a guy named Jim Barker. He called me and said, yo, I want to make you love football again. I said, bro, it's going to be very hard mm -hmm. because I'm thinking about calling it. I'm kind of done. I hate working out, feeling like a pro. Like I was like, I just want a ball. Like I've put so much work in since my injury. I just want to show what I can do. So I'll let you love football again. So I go up there. I'm up there for uh, like two weeks. And so like they kind of make the new guys do like one-on-ones after practice. Tyler, like 40 and 0, like not losing a one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like like I'm winning my ones up there. Um, you know, my wife, it's like a hurricane in Miami. My wife's about to go back to Michigan or Ohio. She calls me like, yo, like, I'm going I'm to go back. And I'm like, you know, Jim, I'm, I think I'm, a, you know, I think I'm about to leave. Like, I don't really want to be a practice player. Like, yeah. I'm going to go home. He calls me and says, yo, like, we just released the four starting receivers. You're playing this week. And I'm like, don't release those guys because of me. Like, I don't even know. Like, yeah, I don't understand what's going on. Like, you know, blah, blah, whatever the reason was. Those were all cool dudes. They all helped me, you know, adjust to the CFL. I had an opportunity to play. So he's like, yo, this is what I'm going to do. Last five games, I'm going to make it your rookie. I'm going to make it the first year of your contract. Next year, you're going to be on a one-year deal. You'll be back in the NFL by 2018 if you ball. I'm like, all right, bet. Yeah. So um, we kind of renegotiated some stuff, gave me a signing bonus, got me to stay. I played the last five games sucked because it was a new league you know what i mean i yeah. had nobody to teach me to learn the curves he obviously cut the vets who were supposed to teach me and then um the rhythm thing too you're coming in middle of the season middle of the season later in the season and then um so the next year barker gets fired new gm comes in new head coach and i'm down in florida just going crazy like like i'm getting back in the league like i'm just like locked, training hard locked in yeah. um during that time I uh I come across this life coach and um he gives me a mantra. Um and it's uh you know just I still I said it on the way here. I say it every morning. Um like and 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 what he told me was like yo like I've studied repetition, I studied religion, I studied um all these guys like Neville Goddard Bob Proctor, um, like like real people who who like giving their life to the law of attraction. Um, and and he's like, yo, like, I want to give you this mantra. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, yo, let's do it. Like, whatever. Come on, stop what I'm doing. Boom. He gives me the mantra. I'm in chills. Eight minutes, I'm in chills. Never it gave the guy my number, email. He never called, never returned the text, nothing. I took everything from that day. I put it in my notes. I still got that note today. I've translated into a voice memo. So it's my voice that I say to myself every day. I um I just played a voice memo. It's, it's been like you check the date on the voice memo. It's been since 2017. And, um, and I just, uh, it changed my life. Um, I started to speak into existence everything that I ever wanted, you know, I, you know, and, um, and I used that when I got to Toronto, um, the next year said it every day. And then like, you know, like when the student is ready, the teacher appears, those guys I mentioned, Ricky Ray, SJ Green, um, Mark Trustman, 
those guys all all really just kind of came into my life. And Mark Tressman put me on Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, um, A New Earth. Um, like I had a teammate that gave me a book called James R. Doty, Into the Magic Shop. Um, and I've read all these things those years. And it just truly uh, like just I was able to get my mental side and I had the best season of my life. We won a, we won a great cup. I won a great cup MVP in the snow. A lot of people seen that. And um, I was able to like put my dream of going back to the league, I signed with the Ravens that next off season after a one year deal. And um, my whole goal was to just get back to the league. You know, I just wanted to get back. And then when I made it, I kind of started seeing through the NFL and I started seeing like, Oh, like, dang, like, they want their drafted guys to play. You know what I mean? They want. Oh, yeah, they, especially if you're the one making the decision to draft them. You're like, I can't be wrong. I mean, it didn't really matter what I did in one-on-ones. It didn't matter what I did in seven-on-seven. Our team, you know, uh, it's funny. You know, I, I had a preseason where I was, uh, me and Lamar had just had great chemistry. I mean, he was a rookie quarterback trying to beat out Joe Flacco. So he was with the twos and threes when he first come in. Obviously, I was a two and three. I 100% thought he was going to cornerback, wide receiver. Nah. He's getting nah. interviewed. He's like, I'm a quarterback. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, nah. Not that I like dude, this man. guy. <laughs> I, I call him the Pompano gangster. That's, he a gangster, man. And, and it's so crazy. When I live in the Florida. Highlight videos him yeah, bro, in yeah, high yeah. school, like just stopping on a dime. Man, Kids he was the first dude that put me on, like, being viral is. Like, yeah. I, said, I, said, I said, gangster, what you going to do on yeah. first, first game? What you going to do? Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? We all out to eat. He said, I'm going to go viral. Yeah. I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, <laughs> I'm old. I'm an OG now. Yeah. He's like, like, I'm about to go so crazy, the highlights are going to go viral. And I'm like, oh, yeah. oh. Write yeah. that one down. Right. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, no, Change so, your mantra a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I mean, uh, I don't, I'm not really a social media guy. Like, I respect it and I need to do a better job of like putting myself out there. But, you know, that year was such a like eye opener that I kind of just realized, like, yo, like, you know, I accomplished my goal of getting back to the league. Like, That's awesome. It's, it's more, I just want to play. Mm -hmm. I want to make my bread. I never got an opportunity at like real free agency. I had, mm -hmm. I created value in Canada. So when the Ravens let me go, I could have did what I did in 16 and stayed around. And like, that's what we were talking about. Like ego, like, you know, like, oh, I'm an NFL guy, but I love football, man. You yeah. know, like I've been playing since before school, like those years of being out on the, like, what hurt most it's not the money it was i didn't get to play the game that i loved or the game that i got to work for so i decided to go back to canada and finish my career up there um signed in vancouver beautiful city after i left you know the ravens got to play with a good quarterback up there uh travis lule we his team was like you know like i think they were like 500 at the time we won eight straight made the playoffs um, lost in the first round in the next year, went to Montreal, signed the top 10, you know, mm -hmm. can, by Canadian standards as far as money. Um, and then uh, took that team from a no playoff team, helped, you know, quarterbacks and the receiver and the office line just bring a winning mentality there. Went to the playoffs that year. Um, then the next year ended up in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, then the pandemic hit. And it kind of was like, yo, like, dang, like, whew, I could take a break. You know what I mean? Because I just, I had been on like, go, go, go. Grime over for yeah. so long. Like, the CFL didn't have a season. So I was able to finally, like, lay out a plan for my nonprofit, really look at life after football, what it was like to be with my family every day. Mm -hmm. um, and what a lot of people don't know, like, you, you spoke to it at the beginning, like, yo, how was I able to transition? If it wasn't for 2020, I wouldn't have had that mental space, you know? So like now I had my mantra. Now I understood what the power of the tongue, you know, life and death reside in power of tongue. I understood what mm -hmm. like land my future and, and, and cast, you know, and you know, broadcasting my dreams and, and being able to like plan meant, you know I mean? I did it for a season. Like I, I manifested winning a, you know, being a part of a winning team. I manifested, you know, getting back to the league. So I was like, yo, like what happens if I do that in life? You know, like, what can I do? So started doing dog crap work, you know, like going on uh, a French radio st show in Montreal with no listeners, yeah. just getting reps, um, 
doing stuff behind the scene with a mentor I have up there, Mo Khan, who just like, you know, I would put a wine cork in my mouth and I would like do interviews so I can like pronunciate my words and, and learn how to do it. Like I understood that when you most American commentators speak from emotional feelings based standpoint, I speak from stats and experience. Mm -hmm. So when I when I talk, I'm gonna give you stats. Mm -hmm. Give you my experience, pronunciate my words, and I'm just gonna like lay out my shit. You know, I'm gonna lay out my answers, and so um, that was all 2020 work. Like you know, because I didn't have football, so I was able to like lay the groundwork for my media. I was able to restructure my nonprofit. Um, I got a, a health tech startup that I'm, I'm hopefully you know building a pro you know building a project up, and we'll probably drop like late 23, 2024. Um, and so like I was able to write the business plan and build the team there and, and get it coded. And so, I mean, it was just such a beautiful year for me to just like regather my thoughts. And then, yeah. And then when I went back to the league CFL, I just was like, oh, I think I'm done. I think I'm ready. You know, I think I'm ready to walk away and, and kind of be done with this version of myself. And, and boom, I'm here today, man. I love it, bro. I love yeah. it. One thing that you said that I think is so just from getting to know you and just your story in general, identity versus ego. Yeah. And you have an identity that I'm a professional. I can do anything and everything that I say and take action on and remove that ego. My identity is a champion. But sometimes people, uh, most people, have too much of an ego to say, no, I'm not going to the CFL. Yeah, so you, you, you know, what are people going to think about me? That's, that's yeah. silly. Right. Yeah. Whereas you want a championship, right? Yeah. And sometimes that championship that you're thinking about, you're, you're manifesting, it just may be a little bit different championship, right? Yeah, life it, is net, that where's the fun in life. If, if it's everything you want. Exactly. You, know, it's, you might have mm -hmm. wanted a champion, a championship Super Bowl ring in the NFL. Mm -hmm. But you got it in the CFL. You know what's so crazy about our rings? The Eagles won in 17. Mm -hmm. Johnston, same ring company. We got the same exact ring. <laughs> but you might you might appreciate the CFL one more because you know you actually had to do way more work to get it. Yeah, man. Whereas if you would have got it in the NFL, it mm -hmm. would have been potentially miraculously getting on the Denver team and mm -hmm. maybe being the third or fourth option and, yeah. and knowing, yeah, I got a championship, but in reality it was Demarius Thomas and, <laughs> yeah. you know, these guys that yeah, kind man. of wanted, Shout right? Shout out DT, man. Beautiful human, man. Yeah. Man, man, connected, man. Amazing dude. Man. Yeah. R.I.P., yeah. man. Amazing yeah. dude. And Ronnie Hill, man. Absolutely. Man, damn, man. That hurts me. Yeah. That just shows you the, the health side of things and just mm -hmm. the power of now, the book that you mentioned and yeah, just man. overall – the game of life, right? The yeah. game of life and how things translate and yeah. when adversity hits, yeah. like we're talking about, like the pandemic, a lot of people, wow. myself included, didn't even know what was going on, what to do. What's funny is I oftentimes think about, yeah. man, I would do anything to go back in that situation where everything is shut down because it oh, was man. like, it was amazing opportunity to like start start fresh yeah it was but amazing. i think people can do that at any time right they can do that right. at any time they can say wait whoa 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 i don't need to be doing this anymore starting tomorrow or starting right now yeah. clean slate yeah. We are. so yeah man yeah. To, to to touch on that ego stuff and i it's like uh i honestly think my marriage and my adversity killed my ego. You know what I mean? Because I love my my wife more than like life itself. You know, I would lay down my life for my for my family, and and I think um, that the sacrifice of the role of being a father like killed my ego, and then. On the field, I learned that if I can help this ma this boy become an African American male in America, um, and teach him everything that I know, like I have to come second or third. You know what I mean? Like like he's first. If if I want this woman 
to be who she wants to be. If I want my family to be like, they got to be my queen, you know? So I have to put down or put or find different ways for my personal desire. And I think like a lot of people who walk this earth, I don't know if they know what their greatest gift is, you know, from the creator, or the universe, God, Jesus, whatever, Allah, whatever you want to say. Um, but I know what mine is. And, and my greatest gift is empathy. Like it's so powerful because I have the ability to put myself in anybody's shoes. And that translates to children, my wife, our relationship, business. And and when you can put yourself in someone's shoes, you see the humanity and you know, like buildings like this, like I can see the blueprint i can see like how someone can say idea manifestation hard work consistency adversity get over boom now i have this beautiful project that is my creation you know like i i can see the steps that it took for that person i can feel their emotions i can see their visions i can i can have a eye to eye view with every human, you know, and and I think that's what makes me um dangerous. You know what I mean? That's what gives me my power. That's what gives me energy is that um my power of empathy. Like the power to feel someone else's heart and see someone else's visions. It helps me understand that there's not much in life that I can't do because if another human did it, I can too. I can go through the emotions. I can feel what they feel. Nipsey always talks about this, uh, you know, RIP Nipsey, but you know, like when you're approaching your goals or your dream, it should feel hard. It should be overwhelming. It should be stressful. Like, like your calling in life is going to crush you. Yep. You know what I mean? Like it's going to crush you and I can see that and feel that. But the people who can, overcome that and transcend that and like they they get what they want out of this their time on this earth and and i see that you know i use my power of empathy for that reason also you know to get on a knee and when my baby boy scrapes his knee or something yeah. or, or you know he has to pull a tooth and i could see the world through his eyes you know yeah. i could see the world through my wife's eyes even the ceo your eyes you know what i mean and i and i just try to always just never forget that. And then um and and that crushes my ego every day. You know what I mean? My power and empathy for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love it, man. I love it. So what do you want to be what do you want to be most remembered for? The the name of my show is All for Nothing. I think a lot of people yeah. unfortunately go day to day. Yeah. They go their whole life. They have ultimately nothing to show for it because they're not building an identity. They're doing a bunch of things for yeah. uh, other people. They're not being empathetic. They're not yeah. living out their purpose. Yeah. Right. Uh, but what is something that you need to do more of maybe less of mm -hmm. to ensure when you look back, yeah. you say, I did not do all of this for nothing. Yeah. I think, you know, my biggest failure in life was, in college, me and my homies started a student organization. It was called Strike the Mic. Strike the Mic? Strike the Mic. And I always think back about this. Like, we wanted to do... Podcasts before podcasts? We wanted to do interview. We wanted to do, like, homecoming interviews with, like, great Ohio State alumni. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to host them at the student union. And we wanted to, like, put it on social media through, uh, like, cameras. And, and I just, I'm sad that I missed that. You know, I'm sad that I didn't capitalize on that. And when my boys see this, they're going to laugh about Strike the <laughs> Mic. Like, you know, it was it was a... Uh, Who are you going to do it with? It was a guy, Donnie Evage, and a guy named Nate Oliver. And we were going to work through uh, a, one of my mentors. Uh, she still works at Ohio State today, Tracy Stuck. She was going to help us become a student organization. Uh, um, we did, you know, we didn't really understand youtube or understand like yeah. the power of you know holding a camera and having a script and you know and and so i always look back at that and and so i think for me just documenting 
and connecting like this. You know, I, I want to do more of that. I want to I want to put myself out there, my story, because I know a lot of people can can learn. You know, what I mean, people say, you know, oh, you got depth, and I, and I laugh like, nah, fam, I got volumes, like encyclopedias of shit people can learn from. Like, I mean, like my, and it's not that I'm cocky. It's just like my journey in life has been hard. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you know, like but then you know other people yeah. in the locker rooms and, mm-hmm. and business deals that may have it. Mm-hmm harder or something yeah. and so i think that's what mm-hmm. this is so special is like yeah, it's not me necessarily having to come on the show every time and talk about this and that it's yeah. given the opportunity to guys like yourself and i appreciate that yeah. man i do I, and, and I, I think you know uh yes how we want to be remembered like like i i want an odyssey story like i want to be a homer you know what i'm saying like i want people to read my story and, and see like, you know, I think the the mark of a, a amazing person is somebody who can make it out of nothing, get it, lose it, and get it back again. You know, I'm that dude. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's who I've always been. You know, I've always been able to, even my story to Ohio State, like, I didn't play varsity to junior year. Bro, like, I had a crazy junior season. I made a highlight tape myself. I had a, my oldest brother was in film at Syracuse. He had a buddy that had a studio. We went down there. Boom. I cut every highlight from a highlight tape. I went on Google. I searched every recruiting coordinator for my dream top 50 schools. I found their address. I wrote a letter. I printed it 50 times. I went to Staples. I got 50 manila envelopes. I made 50 highlight tapes on DVD. I put the letter, the DVD, licked the envelope and I sent it to 50 colleges and I got offers that way. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I wasn't this highly recruited kid, like, like everything I ever gotten, like I've worked for, you know, and, and that's how I ended up here at Ohio state. Greg Gillum saw my letter, watched my holiday tape and responded to me. Boom. Trust was in my house. And so like just to get there, was a story to get to the league was a story going through my and you know my NCA stuff my injuries you know being a father in, in today's world as a professional athlete so I just want people to get inspiration from me I want people to know that you know there's nothing you can't make it through you know, I want people to reach out I want people to say like yo how did you handle this dark time how do you handle you know mental health you know I I'm big on I want to see a psychologist. I'm big on talking about your issues and, and talking to an unbiased opinion. You know, I'm big on, uh, you know, manifestation and your words and your power and the way you speak about yourself and mm-hmm. apologizing to yourself. You know, a Hawaiian, if I was just in Hawaii, it's this Hawaiian pair, Ho'opono Ono. It's where you say, I love you. I forgive you. I'm sorry. I'm thankful. You know, like you, you learn to forgive yourself for things. Um, you learn to love yourself. You learn how to talk nice to yourself because before you create an internal for, voice for yourself, your parents are your internal voice. And so you have to control that internal chatter. And so, you know, I, I just try to help people, you know, with, with, with my stuff and and just accomplish great shit, Tyler, for sure, bro. That's it. Hell yeah, bro. Yeah, you said, you said empathy. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think that one thing I've noticed, bro, which I – admire a lot is vulnerability being vulnerable enough to be like i play a grown man sport mm-hmm. but i can also say i love you bro i remember sure. one of my buddies saying for the first time mm-hmm. i love you bro like you're a great guy i'm like i love you yeah, dudes don't say that to each other right yeah, uh, but being vulnerable enough mm-hmm. to be like hey i know that what that guy had to do to make it to that spot being vulnerable enough yeah. to go make the highlight clip write the handwritten letter not being too big of an ego, right? And I think that being vulnerable, being authentic, being real yeah. is really who you are. And, and it's allowed you to overcome that adversity. Mm-hmm. And uh, people are, are willing to help, right? People are willing to help. But I think you documenting this more, I think, you know, mm-hmm. uh, we've talked about it last couple of times. I think yeah, that's yeah. Hell yeah. I appreciate far, you, man. Thank yeah. you. I think you need to be in front of the camera more. I think that you can share a lot, like just that clip alone of saying, Hey, I wrote 
letters to the top 50 schools is a mm-hmm. huge tip for kids that are wanting to get recruited or that, you know, want to go play at the mm-hmm. next level. Yeah. Hey, no one's going to hand it to you. They also had game too, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you're good. You're yeah, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think that's a great tip, man. Like what are yeah. some other things? And we got to get wrapped up here soon for you. But um, what are some like pieces of advice that you would give those kids that you know, they got game, they're good. Yeah. Uh, like, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of highlight videos now. Yeah. What what can they do to get recruited, to get that scholarship? Yeah. To to if you are a free agent, I think a lot of it's pretty similar. But what what can they do to to get that spot? I know this sounds cliche, but like the work, man. Like like it's undefeated. It mm-hmm. being a good ass dude, you know what I mean, or being a good person, mm-hmm. like and just. Like, quick story. I I was at the Senior Bowl. Um, I get pulled. You know, it's crazy, right? Like these guys, like this year, the Senior Bowl. No, no, this is when I was coming out, oh. 2012. Okay, it's the first time the NFL scouts really get to talk to the seniors. I get pulled into this conference room. I just got back from practice. Shimmy Schimbeckler from the Washington Redskins. He says, "Why do I see?" a big, fast, strong receiver that drops balls? Why do I see a smart, intelligent dude that has great grades but gets in trouble with the NCAA? They don't end up like your father. I said, man, excuse me? And people don't know. I mean, my father passed away when I was 10 years old. He had a drug addiction. I said, excuse me? Like, he says, I'm going to tell you this, Devere. There's no difference between life and the game. You can't cheat life and be great at the game. It's all one and the same. It's the same person. It's the mirror. You got to be a good human and do the right things. And then you also got to work hard and be a great player. You can't cheat the work and you can't cheat being a good ass dude. Like you can't say, I'll run extra sprints and go lift extra, be out cheating on your girlfriend, or be cheating in school, or stealing, robbing, killing, you know, whatever it is, negatively off the field. Yeah. They're going to, it's always going to. Something's going to show up It's somewhere. always going to, it's, it's a parallel. Like, you can't cheat life mm-hmm. and still win. Like, you got to, you can't cheat the game and, and win. Like, I always say this, like, the universe has a consciousness, right? Like the universe knows when, you know, it's, it's the golden rule. Like the universe knows when you put good things out in the air. Yeah. Like I always say like, yo, if your money's down, go do something philanthropic. Yeah. Go give. Mm-hmm. It's going to come back tenfold. Mm-hmm. It's in the Bible. Mm-hmm. If you're not playing, go give. Mm-hmm. Work 10 times harder. It's going to come back tenfold. Those two things go together. You know what I mean? Like just being a good dude, doing the right things, working hard, being a good, you know, player, coachable kid. You know, you know, it, it just goes hand in hand. Like, like you'll become a great player. Guys who are Hall of Famers and great dudes, they're good dudes, man. Like, like, like people give Prime a hard time. Prime ain't never drank. He ain't never smoked. He, anytime he gets an opportunity, he upholds God in front of a microphone. He broadcasts Ray, Ray Lewis. Anytime he has a mic, first thing he says, something about God. Like, like, it's hard to, and Ray Lewis is touchy because. You know, yeah, I was going to bring that up. Yeah, yeah, Ray Lewis is touchy, but. Just not in a parking lot. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But know. the thing is, is like. He's also a great father. You know what I mean? He's also a man of God. And what people don't realize is, is those things translate. Those, things, those two realities run parallel. The universe has a consciousness, and the game has a consciousness. No matter what game it is, you can't cheat the game. Like, the game knows. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and the kids that are, you know, watching this that are in high school or college, like, yeah. the game in life knows. Like, Joey B, man, Burrow. The game knew he's putting in work. It's just, you know, there's another good guy, too, with Haskins, and he kept putting in the work, goes to LSU, 
wins a championship, a Heisman, arguably one of the best collegiate athlete performances. Mm-hmm. In one of the year. best years ever in college maybe, football. Yeah, maybe yeah. top five, maybe number one. I don't know. But I think that with social media, I think with going yeah. viral and all these things, mm-hmm. that it's super easy to have that inflated. False success. Exactly. Yeah. And so you're just telling telling these people, hey, look, like, no, you can be great and have a great career and mm-hmm. absolutely crush it. You don't have to yeah. be anyone else other than yourself. So if you want to be a good guy, uh, you should be. <laughs> Number mm-hmm. one, you don't have to change because of your ego. You've got to change your identity. Uh, I like that a lot, man, because I think yeah. a lot of people, myself included, yeah. right, where it's like, yeah. I got to be assertive and be like, uh, you know, rude to get mm-hmm. this deal done, to get this business decision done. No, yeah. no, no. You got to lead with love yeah. and assertiveness mm-hmm. because I know. This is helping the bigger picture. Yeah. I, I mean, a guy I look at is LeBron, a true Ohio player mm-hmm. from Akron. But what people don't realize is like, like Michael Jordan is, he, he's, he might be some people goat. Kobe might be some people goat. But like to me. Jordan, Jordan was good because he had a gambling addiction. He had to get buckets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But think about LeBron, like this man has a school. He has a film production company. The shut up and play. He's he created something that gave athletes a platform, like the shop. Um, he doesn't. He's not a billionaire that stays away from black people. Like he's in the community. He's a true role model. He's been with the same girl since high school. He brought all his boys with him. He's he put his men on. He's like a true king. And when he becomes the all time leading scorer this year, it's because. Braun has never had anything off the court. Like you can talk about a decision, his hairline, you know, you know, him being a GM all you want. But like he's a true king because he does stuff for the community. He's a true king because, you know, if people watch a godfather, like, if you don't take care of your family, you can't be rich. He's taking care of his family. He's put his boys on. He's he's made other people millionaires around him. Um he's a definition of a true Ohio player to me because he's he's so cool like you know what I mean like fashion like like he no matter what you can say um the dude has transcended everything and he's created this athlete who has a voice he's created this athlete who cares about social issues who can like in a way like I don't know if you can put MJ up there with like Muhammad Ali and Kareem, but like for black men, like a person like LeBron who's helped so many other black men, he's like a Muhammad Ali. That's what I'm saying. You know, he's like a Kareem. He's like a Bill Russell type of dude. Like, like he's a cultural icon. You know what I mean? That's why personally, uh, shout out to LeBron have you on the show here soon for sure is uh why i I genuinely believe he's the goat right and and there could be a new one whatever is because of what you just said people i don't think realize how insane it is all the other things that he's built i didn't even talk about basketball yeah yeah like Like, yeah (laughs) yo not to mention he's about to be the all-time leading scorer he's 87 years old still getting triple doubles right like Even, even I think last night or the night before, someone's talking smack to him, and he's like, "Yo, I'm trying to play ball. You're trying to talk talk smack, like, right? Don't disrespect me. Yeah, I'm just trying to play ball. Yeah, right. Yeah, if you want to disrespect? We'll see. Came down court, banged it on. Yeah, bed, just right? slammed it on. <laughs> and then you know, Unc Sharp is ready to throw down too in the in the crowd. But yeah. the point is, is like I don't think people realize that. Sure, building the business, yeah, being a professional athlete, doing one thing yeah. is very hard. Yeah. Right, doing your career and building a career is very hard, oh. but also doing that at the same level and or a higher level in life oh. is oh. more impressive. Yeah, so. I mean, and I and I touched on it, but like you know, I always speak for my culture and um and you know in business and life, but like to be able to still have you know not be in the hood, but still do things for people who come from there, to still be able to you know be the same kid from Akron 
um, and also be a billionaire. Like, uh, I think that's what's special about him. You know what I mean? I think um, that's why he will be able to play as long as he wants, you know, because he doesn't have to fight being two people every day. Like, can you imagine, like, waking up and being like, and it's for all my social media people, I got to be this social media person every fucking day. Like, I can't be me. Like, like I, I can't. You know, like, oh, like, oh, shit, like, you know, I'm married, but I got side chicks. Like, you know how fucking miserable that is? It's exhausting, right? You know, it's exhausting. Like, do you know how hard it is to be three people at one fucking time? When you're pure and you're the same dude and you can go into any room and I could talk like this with you, I got to talk like this on the radio, talk like this on the news, pick up the phone, call my boys. Like, I don't got to change. Like, I see that in Braun, you know, and... I just feel like that's real freedom, you know, like, like that's real wealth. That's real like health and like that's that's living your dream is being able to be yourself everywhere you go. Yeah, I call it the the rent free mindset where no that. one I love where that. nothing is in your head. You're just you control your thoughts. Yep. Your thoughts become your actions, your actions become your habits and ultimately your destiny. But that's exactly why I believe it's super impressive, specifically with the LeBron. That mm-hmm. obviously I don't know his, you know, life <laughs> day in and day out, but mm-hmm. I think that's again coming back to kids that are trying to go play college football or professional athletes trying to get to that next stage. That's potentially why they don't succeed or hit those goals because they're living two lives. They think they have to be super cool. Mm-hmm. Online and like play a certain way because that's yeah. what went viral. But in reality, <laughs> that's it's exhausting. Like, T. Yeah, you could be the same. Yeah, you could man. be the same on both sides, and it's actually easier. There's less friction. If y'all listening, bro, you <laughs> preaching today, <laughs> dude. Any final thoughts, man? Anything that you want to? Uh, yeah, I wanted to share. bounce a few things off of you, man. So yeah. for you, just you know, I love you. I love your following. I love your videos. They're real educational. I mean, I've learned some stuff. Uh, what? What drives you to be, you know, in this developmental space? How do you, uh, you know, being a guy from Mechanicsburg, come to the big city? You sound and, like a little hillbilly when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah, and just and just laying a foundation that you have. Like, what what's what's helped you, and what's your big vision? Man, I think great question. <laughs> Hell yeah. I didn't know you were going to ask me this, bro. You yeah. should prep me next time. Yeah, I think that. It all started with running. Yeah. It all started with having this uh, mentality in my household that my brother was like the best athlete. Um, my family was good at sports. My father mm-hmm. passed away when I was eight years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, we grew up fast. My mom's working 12, 14 hours a day. That's where mm-hmm. I get my work, e- e- uh, work ethic from. Mm-hmm. Work ethic from. Mm-hmm. Uh, just reflecting on it, it's clearly choking me up a little bit, but it's that mentality, man. It was, it was being the short fat kid yeah. that was super insecure that never would have thought I would be comfortable talking on camera, building a brand, building businesses. But I started running miles, man. And it was, it was like meditation for me. It was, it was diving head first into the fire to say, you know what? I'm not playing on the basketball team because my coach doesn't like me because I got to come off the bench, but I'd be better if I started with running, man, you lace those shoes up. There's no one to blame. Yeah. Hardest part about running, getting there and getting home. (laughs) Hardest parts, just actually doing it right. And there's nothing to blame. Sure. One day it might be cold. One day it might be hot, but it's not the, the quarterback didn't throw you the ball wrong. Right. The coach didn't bench you this play. It's you versus you. I don't think there's anything out there that I've personally done from like a physical and a mindset standpoint that will ever come close, at least for me with running. Right. I started building the discipline. I started building the mentality when it, when it came to running, running saved my life. And so, uh, you know, I went to Wright state university, transferred to Ohio state. Actually, yeah. My Um, sister graduated from there. Okay. There we go. And so, you know, running ultra marathons, 50 mile or hundred mile or actually ran a hundred mile race around the oval. Nice. 24 hours straight around the oval, baby. That's crazy. Let's go. Let's go. 
And uh, I got a mentor. I got a mentor. I went to the mortgage industry and I just started to understand, wow, the power of mentorship, the power of that everything I'm building now, you can build the biggest empire that you want. So I think getting around somebody for the first time, coming from a small town, coming from adversity, coming from financial struggle, coming from limited beliefs, coming from this lower frequency state yeah. by putting in the work, putting in the shadow work, diving yeah. head first into the fire, yeah. going, wait, this mentor, multimillionaire, taking me to expensive dinners, popping bottles at the club, but also relentless work ethic. You can do anything and everything you want. And it can be a lot of fun too. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. And last but not least is leverage, right? Understanding that I created this show, not necessarily just to always talk about me and my journey, but again, for awesome guys like you to do the same. And I can leverage that and, and the key things that you know, right? To put out even more content, to cut more deals, to make more money by using your time, right? And your resources, vice versa. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck is nothing ever beats hard work, but then you yeah. got to start working a little smarter and working yeah. smarter can sometimes be the hard work. Yeah. So the leverage piece, how can who I leverage? You know exactly. Or yeah. it's who can get this done? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily how do I have to do this? So it's the who, not the how. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, you know, it's, it's instilling a mentality, a legacy, and documenting the journey because I know the moment I have a kid and they're 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever, or I adopt a kid, this is what I want to be remembered for. Yeah. Not the real estate properties, not the money. It's looking back and them watching or listening and going, wow, what my dad said was, that was dumb. Right. He definitely doesn't say that anymore. Yeah. They're like, oh, wow. He said that consistently, consistently, consistently. And, and seeing yourself evolve. Mm -hmm. Right. It, yeah. It's being vulnerable. Yeah. I remember when I first started recording content and stuff, yeah. being so insecure because I valued other people's opinion on the other side, watching in and listening more than my own. I'm going to come back and watch this show and there's going to be two to three things I did. And I'm going to be like, man, why'd you ask him that? Why did you interrupt him? Why'd you do this and that? But it's the journey. who cares? It's the journey. Yeah. It's, it's just so crazy. You said that. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but so we were just in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And this is so cool. Um, it's this thing. We're in Maui. And it's this thing called the road to Hana. Mm -hmm. And my man out there, Jim Elliott, shout out my dude, Jimbo Slice. Cool dude. He told me this. He said, there's nothing in Hana. There's nothing. In, it's a, it's a six hour destination. So there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. It's the road to Hana. It's the waterfalls off to the side. It's the black sand beach, the peak sand beach. You know, the, the coves, the dives, the little things along the way. How you feel, your emotions, your thoughts. The views, you know, like the, the breathtaking views. And then he said, so many people get to Maui and just want to drive to Hana and they're upset because there's nothing there. And they missed the beauty on the way. And I was like, the irony of life. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and that's the name of the show, man. Let's make sure that we're not doing all of this for nothing. Amen. So. Amen. Thanks for having me, bro. Appreciate you, brother. Hell yeah, dog. First that was minute. dope. That was dope. Hell yeah.